I know from working at Eastman, don't have regular contact with people in the other arts or in literature. Uh, no. And uh, we know, though, that uh, uh, concerts can often be very en- enlivened by bringing in uh, dancers or uh, uh, video and so on, and there are attempts to do that now. Uh, musicians often don't know even where to turn. Don't know they don't know a poet that they could say, "Would you write some poems and declaim them from stage before I play this piece?" Uh, because we musicians live in our own little world. It's true, and since I teach at Juilliard, I can see this regularly. Juilliard, after all, has not only music, but it has a drama division and a dance division, mm-hmm. and also a very serious jazz program. Mm-hmm. But these four things don't mingle. Mm -hmm. I have occasionally had a jazz student in one of my classes, but the educational programs are distinct. Interdisciplinary work is rare. Mm -hmm. The the administration would love it to happen, Mm -hmm. but there's no real way that it can, considering that everybody's focused on their own education. And God knows, I would be delighted, but quite surprised if... The New York Philharmonic should premiere a new piece and suddenly we see the hall full of painters and Mm -hmm. poets Mm -hmm. and playwrights Mm -hmm. and literary critics. It just doesn't happen. Well, it is bound to happen more as I think uh, people are beginning to experiment with the concert format. Mm. Uh, And uh, here at the Eastman School, there's a women's music festival now that happens in the spring. And they intentionally uh, uh, do poetry readings in between the the musical numbers. And it's very interesting often how uh, the the, the resonances will go between the literature and the music. But you wrote for a rather extraordinary volume called Rethinking Music, Mm -hmm. an essay on how musicologists can actually use their work to affect the outside world. The book is a collection of essays rethinking many things about classical music and how it fits in the world at large and how we think about it. Your essay was rethinking the role of the musicologist not simply as somebody going to discover how to read medieval manuscripts or which note to begin a trill on or Mm -hmm. exactly how instruments of the past were built and how many of them were in the orchestra. You're actually going to make a difference to the lives of people, maybe who don't have anything to do with music at all. Well, one of the points that I, I wanted to make, first of all, is that musicologists are often uh conveying social messages in the course of their work without even maybe yes. realizing it. Uh, and I was trying to encourage musicologists to be a little bit more overt or transparent mm-hmm. about what their motivations are, what their values are, uh, what their premises are, because often, for example, what we're trying to show is that, uh, oh, Italian music in the 19th century was more uh, varied than people mm-hmm. give it credit for. or that, mean not all just uh, opera? Uh, not all just opera. Yeah. Uh, uh, or uh, often people are uh, trying to show uh, uh, that, that works that are uh, seem very difficult and complex uh, are actually uh, ones that people can understand if they just mm-hmm. pay attention and so on. So it's, there's, there's a kind of message there about uh, uh, the ability of regular people to, to deal with masterpieces. It's a very big issue now. Absolutely, because yes. The classical music field feels that it has to open itself up to a wider audience, probably because the audience it has is perceived to be shrinking. Given this, how do you do that? Some people would say, but there's a big obstacle. The pieces cannot be understood unless you have some education in their structure Mm -hmm. and history. And a musicologist who heavily emphasized the structure and history of a piece might be contributing to that sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people might say, no, just take down the walls, Mm -hmm. make the performances a little bit more informal, and the music will speak for itself. And maybe a musicologist, well, tell me how a musicologist might support that point of view in his or her work? uh, One of the points that I know I often try to do is to to is to figure out what the likely meanings that a work mm. had for people at the mm. time. 
And you can sometimes find this by looking at reviews uh, of early performances. For example, uh, Verdi's Aida mm. was a work that... Uh, that, that's a case of work that was enormously popular yes. early on, so it doesn't have the, the complexity issue mm-hmm. in a sense. Uh, but the question of what did it mean at the time, uh, if you uh, read uh, what, the review of the very first performance uh, uh, in, in Cairo, uh, there were two European critics who were there, and one of them uh, specifically talked about uh, the bizarre sound mm. of the, um, the the long, the long trumpets mm-hmm. doing bom, 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 yeah, in, okay. the, in the famous in, in march, the, in the famous march, in the right? Uh, uh, and uh, he was this to us sounds we're so familiar with it that uh, uh, it seems perhaps a bit uh, uh, safe and predictable and so on, but to him it was like the strangest thing, mm-hmm. uh, maybe because they weren't the regular trumpets are also because the trumpets were playing the, the natural overtone series to a large extent, so that there's only a limited number of pitches uh, that the trumpets can play. Uh, and that makes us realize that some of this music sounded more challenging, in a way, and more surprising than and we might expect. more dramatic. It's more dramatic, In the yeah. very simple sense. Mm-hmm. I don't mean opera as drama expressed through music. I simply mean, my God, listen to that mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. it happened. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think that that may be far more true than we now understand with many, many works Mm -hmm. in the repertoire. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. If you listen to early performances of uh, Debussy, for example, uh, uh, the the people like George Copeland was the Mm -hmm. one of the pianists who uh, Mm -hmm. um, uh, first brought his uh, works to the United, piano works to the United States. They may not have quite the level of technical Sheen that we expect, but there's a kind of poetry there. Obviously, mm. people early on heard something magical, and uh, 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 there's a certain aura to the piece that, that I think listeners must have caught on to very soon. Yeah, because one thing they had back then that we can't recapture very easily is they didn't know it. They didn't right. know the music. Mm-hmm. They didn't know what they were going to hear. They couldn't say, oh, Debussy, <laughs> so lovely that he doesn't develop his themes, he just juxtaposes. Mm-hmm. So lovely that the harmonies shift. But then I think people were saying, what's happening here? I feel adrift. Mm-hmm. And for some people, that might have been a tremendously pleasurable experience, and for others, uh, very disconcerting. Right. The, the question about what musicologists, that other right. article you were, you were talking about, uh, what musicologists can do uh, one thought that occurs to me is that a number of musicologists have been very involved in digging up works of women composers. Mm. I'm just talking about the Women's Music Festival here. Uh, and the uh, that, that whole question of uh, kind of shining a light into the dark corners of music history is very important. Uh, there have been many scholars who have discovered important composers. One of the most significant is Fa- Fanny Hensel, who is Mendelssohn's Felix Mendelssohn's sister, uh, who was enormously talented and wrote some of those beautiful piano pieces and songs uh, uh, in the whole 19th century. And this body of work is mm. now available. Uh, it's quite wonderful to hear it. And in the, the scholars who are involved in this uh, are essentially carrying out uh, uh, certain social ideals, which is to draw attention to women of talent, encourage women uh, uh, today, and uh, it seems to me that's just a wonderful role that scholars can play. Well, it is, and it, I think it really speaks to the position of classical music in society today and why more people don't take an interest in it. Now, I'm sure that there are some people who are hearing this and they're rolling their eyes a little bit and they're saying, oh, God, here we go, political correctness. Mm-hmm. We have to try it out, all these women composers, whether they're good or not. But... The other side of that coin, which to me is much more important, is that 